distinct pleasure to introduce my good friend Rod Machado. I've been watching Rod since I was a student pilot, which is longer ago than I like to think about, and I'm sure, Rod, you'll say the same. Uh, but uh, the man who needs no introduction, as soon as I can find him here in my list, I will uh, let you take the show. Good morning, Rod. How are you doing? Mike, I'm doing very well. Uh, testing, one, two, three, can you hear me? We got you five by five. That is so nice. First time I've heard that in a long time, especially yeah, the since the, the radios in my airplane. Uh, well, they uh, they usually work better when I hit them with a radio improvement device, otherwise known as my shoe. So um, every once in a while, you have to do that with electronic equipment. But I'm doing fine, and I hope everybody else is doing uh is doing fine there. And uh, I just want to say how uh, appreciative I am to participate in California Zooming and uh, recommend to everybody, if you're not a member of Cal Pilots, please uh, consider joining. What a wonderful organization that supports aviation, aviation education, and uh, gives pilots another reason to get together. It's not as if we don't already have reasons to get together, but uh, it is a, uh, it's always good to have another one. And I uh, appreciate that uh, very, very much, Mike. And hello, audience. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And I have 45 minutes today to, and then 15 minutes of uh, questions. So um, I'm not going to show you any slides. Well, I may show you one thing, uh, but I'm just going to talk to you mano a mano or mano a womano, uh, however you like to perceive that. And uh, we'll talk about things that are uh, hopefully important to you and uh, explore, so to speak, the... Uh, aviation frontier, some of the things that you may have heard before and some of the things maybe you haven't heard before. I've been flying for now about 54 years. I started when I was 16 years old. Got my license when I was 17 years old. They handed it to me and I immediately raced away from the airport before they realized what a terrible mistake they had made. And <laughs> I don't think they made a mistake, but just in case uh, I got away from the scene of the crime, uh, it wasn't the scene of the climb because I took my check right into Cessna 150. Uh, there's no climb involved with that. And I, I own a Cessna 150. And as I tell everybody, I have uh, I checked it out now with way over 10,000 hours of flying time. I have uh, I calculated 3000 hours of time in a Cessna 150, of which 2950 of those hours uh, were spent climbing. So uh, I have a lot of experience teaching in that airplane. And most of the time I've earned, in fact, I'd say about 90% of it has all been from teaching other people to fly. And I've been very, very important, uh, very, very uh, happy to be able to have had that experience. You know, it's interesting when you're young, you don't quite know what you want to do. And uh, I couldn't wait to get hired by the airlines. And in 1976, United Airlines called me in for an interview. And it was interesting because at that time, I had about 2,700 hours of, of flight time. I had an ATP at 23. And uh, and uh, I know I sound like the kamikaze pilot, the kind of guy that has to do all his bragging ahead of time. But uh, I just... I just built up a lot of flight time. In fact, in one year, I put in 1,240 hours of flight instruction time. I have no idea how I did that, but I did. So United Airlines brought me in and they asked me a few questions. And when they realized uh, that all my flight time was mostly single engine time, uh, uh, well, they threw me back in to the water, so to speak. I felt like a, a tiny undersized trout, but it turned out to be one of the best things that has ever happened to me. Because it allowed me to find out who I was. And what I realized at that time was I didn't know who I was. I thought I wanted to be an airline pilot. And I probably would have been very happy being an airline pilot. But it turned out that um, I wanted to be, more than anything, a flight instructor. I just like teaching people how to fly. I like teaching ground school. I like teaching people in airplanes. It, it was the most amazing thing once you realize in life who you are what you want to do and to be able to do that and to do it now for 54 years uh 51 years as a, a flight instructor has been an insanely wonderful experience and then i went on and i studied psychology and uh, uh in college uh i didn't want to study uh, the you know type of clinical psychology because i i didn't want to work with emotionally disturbed people uh you know so that's one of the reasons why i got into aviation and uh, it turned out that uh, um, 
it really didn't matter because I'm still working with emotionally disturbed people, people who are just so high on airplanes and go gaga and have plane on the brain. And uh, that's the kind of person I like to work with. And, um, you know, one of the things that's uh, interesting to me is uh, how we enjoy flying or how we find ways not to enjoy it. And recently, uh, many people have found a way not to enjoy aviation. And that's what I want to explore here initially. We had the uh, uh, unfortunate, uh, terrible crash of Richard McSpadden. And Richard McSpadden, who I knew, is a wonderful man, very insightful fellow. And uh, he was AOPA's and Air Safety Institute's aviation safety uh, uh, representative. And he was an aviation safety maven, ex-Air Force pilot, uh, a person that just took aviation safety to a very high level. And he took off uh, from an airport last year in a cardinal with another gentleman on board and the airplane apparently on takeoff uh, or uh, after takeoff, short period of time after takeoff, had an engine failure. And uh, the airplane uh, was returning to the airport and hit an embankment short of the runway, about 15 feet below the embankment. And Richard and his passenger were killed. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, the, the, the terrible, a terrible, sad, sad thing. Uh, I mean, really uh, an unfortunate event. You know, the, the, the response I got from so many people was this. If somebody like that could actually crash an airplane with his experience and <clears throat> his insight and being a representative of aviation safety for uh, the Air Safety Institute at AOPA, somebody like that could crash an airplane. How do I know I'm not going to crash an airplane? Why is it that I am not uh, as vulnerable as, if not more so, uh, not having had the experience or uh, the, the, the flight time, uh, the study, the training that Richard McSpadden had? That's the question people typically ask themselves. And it causes a great deal of angst among pilots. And the, uh, the <clears throat> very sad part about that is that people let that bother them to the degree that uh, it ruins their enjoyment of flying. Well, I want to ask you this question if you happen to be one of those people that thought that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. And my question to you would be this. What makes you think that you would accept the same degree of risk that another pilot in this case, it would be Richard McSpadden, uh, would accept on that flight, on that day, in that airplane, under those circumstances. You see, because in order to feel bad about, and in other words, other than just the, uh, the humanitarian aspect, but in order to feel uh, bad about someone else crashing an airplane in a way that you let it affect the way you fly, and keep in mind, this is a this was a real tragic accident. But in order to feel bad about that and let it affect your flying, you have to assume that you would ex that you would assume the same level of risk as the other pilot. And that is probably one of the most illogical assumptions we can make as a pilot, because you have no idea what the risk is. Number one, you have no idea how that pilot uh, uh, assessed it. You have no idea what the environmental circumstances were. And even though uh, Richard McSpadden was a highly experienced pilot, and we know nothing about the accident, by the way, let's be clear about that. The NTSB has been mum. They haven't said a thing uh, on this accident. And that's because they typically take a long time to uh, investigate these accidents. And only one report that I've seen on this, so nobody knows. So I'm not making a comment on the accident. But I am saying this. In order to feel bad, you have to assume the same risk that the other pilot would uh, assume, and you know nothing about the risk. Then you'll say to me, okay, but he was a very experienced pilot. Okay, yeah, very experienced pilots still crash airplanes. Well, they don't do it as often as an inexperienced pilot, but they still crash airplanes. And the amazing thing is they do it for the same reasons, sometimes inattention, distraction, and complacency. And uh, those affect all pilots because those things affect human beings and all pilots are human beings. So uh, it, I, I just want to point out how illogical it is to assume that we would assume the same risk as the other pilot. Because when you think about it, if you have a lot of experience as a pilot, you don't need a statistical analysis of the database, the accident database, to make a risk assessment. All you need to do is just to um, 
tap into your own personal experience uh, whereby you would think, okay, I've seen this happen. That doesn't happen too often. So I think this is the most likely risk, high risk, low risk, or whatever uh, variation in between. And you, I'll go fly or I won't fly. As a pilot who may not have as much time, you can't use your experience to make that assessment. So you may have to rely on some other means, like asking another highly experienced pilot what the risk is. So uh, if you were to make an assessment by sitting in your room, reading an accident report and say, wow, if he had an accident, I may have an accident. Uh, that is that is completely uh, inaccurate and an illogical assessment of the data. And that type of logic would cause Aristotle to spin in his grave uh, because you might be more conservative. You, if you don't know uh, what's happening with the airplane, uh, if, 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 you, if things look un uncomfortable, unfamiliar, uh, you may say, I elect not to fly. Uh, even though another pilot may fly, you'll say, I elect not to fly. You, you'll probably make a completely different judgment based on the hazards involved at that time. And that's the point I want to make. There's no way you can assume you'd make the same assessment of risk that the pilot would, or you would underestimate the risk or the hazard that the other highly experienced pilot uh, might have underestimated. And that's a, a very important point to consider because uh, for that matter, excuse me, for that matter, Flying is supposed to be one of our fun things, and we always find interesting ways to uh, uh, sabotage the uh, experience we have in an airplane, uh, perhaps by worrying too much about uh, the risk or worrying too much about hazards, and you have to think about those things, of course, but uh, we also have to work on making it a fun thing for us. One of my fun things about being in an airplane is uh, getting up to altitude pulling out a thermos, pouring coffee into a plastic cup, kind of like the one you just saw me uh, drink out of. It's not coffee. It happens to be iced tea. And uh, a cruise altitude, setting the airplane up for cruise and flying straight and level flight, you know, doing both of those at the same time, uh, because that's, that's what you do in straight and level flight, and uh, just enjoying the environment. And I, I, one time I remember coming out of Reno <clears throat> in an A36 Bonanza, I got up to cruise altitude, and I thought, ah, this is great. It's a beautiful uh, environment. The air was calm. And I, I was just ah, I was just in my element. Took out my thermos, poured some coffee, uh, put a, a cap on the uh, lid on the coffee, put the coffee cup between my legs. And of course, uh, I normally take off my shoes whenever I'm flying because I just like the cool air blowing uh, on my toes. And, uh, you know, I just open the vent and it just it just adds to the pleasure I receive because I, I work on making flying. In particular, I work on keeping flying one of my fun things. And so uh, I tune the radio and as I look away, tune the radio, whatever else I was doing there. I think I had a KLN 89B at the time, GPS and those things. You always you have to make about 80 twists of the wrist in order to be able to get the uh, proper uh, 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 coordinates loaded and get the GPS tracking. And as I look back from my coffee, it's gone. And I go, oh, no, where, where did it go? Not too many places the coffee can go. I look down between my legs. and My coffee had flipped upside down into my shoe and it's pouring out into my shoe so i grabbed the coffee cup half i'd say about two-thirds of the coffee had uh, seeped into the shoe it just poured right in there so i put the coffee cup between my leg had the shoe and i thought oh no that's coffee in there and i wanted to enjoy an entire cup of coffee and i thought to myself in true pilot fashion there was no way in the world I was going to let that coffee go to waste. And yes, I took off the cup of the, the top of the coffee, poured the coffee from my shoe into the cup, put the cap back on, and I thought, hey, doesn't matter. This is coffee, and I'm going to drink it, and I'm going to have a good time. Again, we have to work on making flying one of our fun things and keeping it one of our fun things. And I sipped the coffee, and all of a sudden it hit me. It just, it just hit me, the taste. I thought, ah. It tastes just like Starbucks. And then it dawned on me again. I realized that's how they do it. 
They're using shoes back there in order to enhance the coffee taste because that was the best tasting, tasting cup of coffee I had in a long time. <laughs> well, uh, and that's a true story. Um, it's um, it, 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 it tasted just as good. But you see, I'm sitting up there at altitude, and that's when I started thinking about why is it that we enjoy being at altitude in cruise flight and being able to uh, look out uh, and enjoy the view. So I did a little research, and I, I even wrote an article on this. I came up with some research by Dr. Uh, Irving Biederman at Irvine University. And he had done some uh, research on uh, the uh, uh, what he called the, the uh, panorama principle. Uh, in other words, the joy of large vistas. In other words, why, why is it that a, a large open vista gives us such pleasure when we look at it versus looking at a wall? A wall doesn't give us much pleasure. And it was interesting because what he realized was uh, human beings are infovores. And as an infovore, we collect information. We want to get as much information as we can, as we need, at the appropriate time. And it just so happens that the visual inputs to the brain, in particular, uh, the um, uh, opiate ventral receptor pathways in our parahippocampal complex are, are very dense and very rich. So any visual stimulus, uh, any, any things that, that we see uh, sight-wise, gives us great stimulation and it also activates the opiate receptors in our brain. Yes, the opiate receptors are the things that uh, when stimulate, stimulated give us great pleasure. And um, the uh, I won't tell you where the uh, perihippocampal cortex is because I don't want you poking it with your finger. But the point is that it is a, uh, it is a, a part of our brain that responds to large vistas, and uh, it, it tends to give us immediate pleasure by looking at something that is uh, uh, expansive in that way. And what uh, Biederman says is, when you, you look, for example, at a, a painting, a Monet, uh, which, of course, if you have one in your house, it probably costs you a lot of Monet to own. But a Monet is an Impressionist painting. And Monet, of course, made many Impressionist paintings. And the Impressionist painting allows you to project your imagination into it and sort of, um, you know, add to it based on your personality, uh, what you imagine, what you, your desires, ambitions, and things like that. That's why it's kind of ill-defined. And uh, the, the, the Impressionist paintings are, you know, they don't have straight lines, so to speak. And uh, you look at that and it gives you great pleasure. And you look at it again and you look at it again. It's, it's uh, so sensory rich. And again, it activates our parahippocampal cortex and we get opiate stimulus in our brain. You don't get the same stimulus when you look at a wall. Walls are, are a, a, a very nondescript. They don't give you much information. I, and so it's boring. So why is it that in an airplane, you can look outside the window and get such great stimulus. And the reason is, and Biederman didn't talk about this, but this is my inference based on what he said and, and what he wrote in his, uh, his theory. In, that, in an airplane, the vista is always changing. When you make a turn from one uh, heading to the next, the vista changes. When you make a turn to another heading, the vista changes. Go up or go down in altitude, the vista changes. So the scenery is always changing. And therefore, it's constantly stimulating that parahippocampal cortex. And we're getting an opiate release, an opiate surge in the uh, to the opiate receptors in our brain. And therefore, we get pleasure out of it. We feel good about it. And that's part of the reason. There is actually a reason why you feel like that in an airplane. It's pretty interesting. But the psych idea, the idea of being able to see and look and see and get pleasure can also uh, have some downsides too. Uh, there was a, a gentleman by Dr. Jeremy, a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Jeremy Wolf at the Harvard uh, Visual Reference uh, Lab and uh, at Harvard University, and uh, he was working on something called the prevalence error. And even though, again, things can give you, you get great pleasure by seeing, seeing constantly changing vistas, 
it's also possible that you may look for, and this is a different theory now, you may look for something that doesn't have great prevalence. Keep in mind, the name of this theory is the prevalence uh, prevalence error, the prevalence error theory. It is possible that something, when you look for it, if it doesn't have great prevalence, in other words, if you don't see it often, then it may appear there and infrequently, and if it does, you may not see it. <clears throat> Let me give it a good example of this. This is going to shock you. I know it did me many years ago when I did this research myself. When the TSA uh, screens baggage to see, uh, you know, check for uh, bombs, uh, uh, guns, knives, uh, you know, uh, any of the weapons people sometimes try to bring on an airplane. Or if you're the underwear bomber, people that try to sneak on with a bomb in their underwear, uh, otherwise known as fruit of the boom underwear, uh, the TSA often misses the items that pass through their scanners. As a matter of fact, the miss rate can be as high as 70%. Now, that is kind of shocking. So you could actually have a guy walk through and he's got uh, uh, three surface-to-air missiles, a SAM rocket launcher, five hand grenades, two Sig Sauer P-236 uh, handguns. He's got a, a, a sharpened boomerang and a, a catapult. And, uh, and it's possible he could make it through uh, a TSA checkpoint. And of course, the TSA often asks questions, you know, do you have any weapons in there? No. Yeah. You have, have any catapults in there? No. No. I have a trebuchet. Oh, okay. Well, that's what does trebuchet mean? Uh, it's French for catapult. Oh, that's okay. Come on through. And, uh, but, you know, it's possible they won't catch you. Well, how does that apply to you flying an airplane? And I, I found this interesting because what I realized was sometimes I'd look on the runway. And I couldn't see what was there. And the reason I couldn't see it is because <clears throat> there were things on the runway that didn't have a lot of prevalence. In other words, they were not prevalent. Said another way, they don't appear there very often. If something doesn't have prevalence, then uh, it, and when it suddenly appears, you're less likely to see it. And... Uh, and another, by way of another example, to really make the, and reinforce the point here, I had a candy bar. <clears throat> I put it in the cupboard, my pantry, and I don't normally put a candy bar on the shelf in the pantry. And I set it up on the second shelf, and uh, I was going to come back for it later. <clears throat> well, I don't keep candy bars in my pantry. So I went back to the pantry the next day looking for my candy bar, and I couldn't find it. And I looked, and I looked, and then I had my wife come in and look. And she found it. It was sitting right exactly where I put it. And because I don't keep candy bars in my pantry, in other words, because they don't have a lot of prevalence on the second shelf, I didn't see it in accordance with uh, Jeremy, Dr. Jeremy Wolf's uh, theory called the prevalence error. Now, that, again, is fascinating because there have been a number of occasions where pilots have landed on a runway not expecting to see animals, deer, wolf, uh, wolves, uh, dogs, or any other kind of wildlife, and they run into them. In other words, have a wildlife strike on takeoff, on, on, on landing, as well as on takeoff. And uh, the, uh, the issue is, you know, we think, gosh, how could you not see that? And again, because wildlife don't have a lot of prevalence on the runway. So you think, how do, and by the way, <laughs> another example of this, uh, I was making an approach to Big Bear one time with a student. Big Bear is a uh, name of an airport. It sits, it's up in the mountains. It's about 6,080 feet high. And uh, I was making an approach there. And uh, as we're approaching the runway, uh, you know, the runway is just like a regular runway, right, white stripe, you know, black and so on and so forth. But uh, as we're approaching, it, it, I, I was looking on the runway, scanning it, didn't think much of it. And my student goes, oh, no, no, squirrel. And I'll be darned, there's a squirrel right on the runway, just to the little bit off center line. And uh, it probably would have been a lot safer. It was actually right on center line because nobody lands there. And uh, you should, you should land there. 
And uh, I, I look at it and it was too late. By this time, it was just too late. She saw it. I didn't see it. I have a lot of experience looking at runways and, uh, and I fly with students. So I have a lot of experience looking at runways going like this. And I honest, I just didn't see the squirrel. And she says, oh, we got to do something. And I said, no, no, we're not going to do anything. Uh, the squirrel's not stupid. It's going to move. It's not a dumb squirrel. So uh, as we get down, because it was, we were too low, high density altitude. I, I didn't, didn't want to go around. It wasn't necessary. Squirrel's going to jump off the runway. So we come down and starts to flare and she's flying the airplane flare and touch down all of a sudden. Boom. And uh, <laughs> she goes, Oh no. And I go, I go, ah, I, I, I guess the squirrel wasn't as start smart as we, we thought it was. And uh, I, I, and I felt really bad about that. Uh, but I said, you know, to my student, at least you get to go home with a new hat. And uh, so, I mean, what are you going to do? I, I I felt bad about that, but uh, hopefully the people at PETA uh, didn't find out about it uh, because uh, they uh, they've been giving me a hard time anyway. People who eat uh, tasty animals, PETA. Now, people for the ethical treatment of animals. Anyway, the point is there that how do you handle uh, the prevalence error? What do you need to do to keep yourself safe when landing or taking off uh, at an airport when, you know, this prevalence error seems to keep us us from seeing things that, you know, we need to see. And the answer, according to Dr. Jeremy Wolf, and it's a brilliant answer, and that is you treat everything where it's critical as a suspect. In other words, you treat it just like a police officer treats suspects. You treat them warily, you watch them, you pay attention to them, and you don't let them pull a fast one on you. Well, that's just police lingo, street talk lingo for if I'm taken off on a runway. And I know that uh, wildlife, uh, there's a potential for wildlife crossing the runway. Uh, then, you know, my, my mind is focused. I'm looking. I'm actually trying to see what is not frequently there that could be there. And that simple act of self-reflection saying to yourself, okay, I'm going to treat the runway as a suspect. I'm going to watch. I'm going to be careful. Uh, and it really doesn't matter whether or not you're in a wildlife area or not. One should always do that because there can be things other than wildlife, like wild airplanes on the runway. And that, of course, is what we need to do in order to protect ourselves against the, uh, the, the, the dangers of runway incursions made by other pilots who want to use our runway as we're using it. So again, treat it as a suspect, just like police officers do. And that's how you handle the prevalence error. That's very important to do. A buddy of mine hit a deer on takeoff. And I, I you know, you think, okay, deer, that's pretty serious stuff, right? Because, you know, uh, about 67% of all the accidents or 60, I think it's about 60% are all the uh, deer collision accidents occur on landing, but about 36% occur on takeoff. And believe it or not, according to the NTSB, out of that 36%, 3% of the deer accidents or deer collision accidents occur on, I'm not making this up. This is an NTSB statistic. 3% of the 36% occur on climb out. That's what the NTSB said. Apparently, the deer are just gauging their jump at the right time so that when you're climbing out, they decide to jump right in front of your airplane. Well, I'm sure it's not intentional, but, uh, you know, a white-tailed deer can jump very, very, I mean, it can, can jump nine feet in the air. It's, they have powerful legs and they're very capable of jumping very, very high. So anyway, something to pay attention to. Um you know, you don't, you don't want to fear, you know, taking off. You don't want to fear landing. You want to make flying, as my main theme here is, you want to make flying and keep flying one of your fun things. And uh, I've known so many people over the years that have just, you know, turned away from aviation because they either got scared in an airplane or because uh, they, you know, felt that they couldn't fly the way that they used to fly an airplane and thought, well, you know, I, I'm, I, if I can't do it the way I used to do it, I'm not going to do it anymore. You know, that's a terrible shame. And think about it. Uh, I'm 71 years old and uh, I'm still able to fly an airplane. I, I instruct 
uh, quite frequently, and my mind is still as sharp as it's as it's ever been. Some of you may disagree with that, but uh, I, I feel it is. My reflexes are relatively fast. In other words, I'm not going to get uh, run over by two guys pushing a car with a flat tire. But the point is that um, uh, I, I, I have many years of flying ahead of me, and I hope I do anyway. And um, I've had people in my situation, similar situation, similar age, but they don't quite have the same reflexes. They don't have uh, the same mental, let's say, fluidity. And they were flying bigger airplanes, like, let's say, a P-210, a Cessna 421, a Cessna 310. And uh, I've had them say to me in sort of an act of self-confession, um, and more probably as an act of desperation, because they still wanted to fly, but they were getting scared. They, they found themselves scaring themselves. And I said, you need to get a smaller airplane, Bob. You need to get a smaller airplane. You need to get a uh, a slower airplane. And uh, a lot of people were initially, that I've talked to over the years, were initially resistant to that because they were used to flying faster, higher performance equipment. And you know what? They couldn't do it anymore. They simply couldn't do it anymore. Because sometimes as you get older, you have to slow down. So like a friend of mine uh, was co-pilot on a Boeing 747 for Flying Tigers, Flying Tiger Airline. And the captain uh, was an older fellow nearing retirement age. They're going into uh, Chicago and the captain and the weather's really bad. And the captain looks over at my buddy, John, and says, John, John, call a Chicago approach. Tell him we want to slow down 20 knots. And John goes, okay, captain, I'll do that. But just in case he asked why, what should I say? And the captain looked over at him, you know, pulled out his cigar and says, you tell him I need time to think and put your cigar back in there and start flying the airplane. Uh, I always thought that was such a great story because sometimes, you know, the old captain realized he wasn't thinking as fast as he used to, so he had to force himself to slow down. And he did. He did it with his time dilator, otherwise known as the throttles. Well, the point here is this. Uh, several people I've talked to over the years have downgraded to a, uh, let's say, side-graded. Maybe, maybe that's a euphemistic way to say it. Side-graded to a smaller airplane. And, and here's the best part. Rediscovered the joy of flying low and slow. And if you are used to flying fast airplanes because you're going places and 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 uh, you you use the airplane for travel and what have you, there's a whole nother area of aviation to learn to well to reacquaint yourself with, to learn to enjoy again the same joy you experience when you learn to fly. And you learn to fly. You didn't learn to fly in a Boeing 747. You learned to fly in a Cessna 150 or a Cessna 150 Landomatic, as they used to call it, or like I did in a Taylorcraft L2, which is a warbird. Yes, I actually learned to fly in a Taylorcraft L2, sort of like a uh, um, uh, same sidestep as a J3 Cub, an amazing little airplane. But I own a Cessna 150, and for fun, uh, I go out and fly my little airplane, and I'll go out, make turns do touch and go landings. I mean, I'm not going to, I had a P210 and an A36, but since I wasn't traveling as much anymore, I decided I'm going to get a smaller airplane, use it for training and also use it because I love flying low and slow. And so even though I had to give up flying bigger airplanes because I'm not traveling, my small airplane makes me the happiest guy in the world when I'm out there flying it. And uh, something for you to consider if you find yourself being overwhelmed by your airplane. And by the way, Sometimes people just scare themselves to death in an airplane uh, for reasons that they don't really, uh, for reasons that are unnecessary. Um, and they scare themselves to death because they don't go out and get upgrade training. Upgrade, not in terms of airplane upgrade, but in terms of skill upgrade. So uh, I'll give you a good example of that. Whenever I give flight reviews, and I give, you know, maybe one or two flight reviews a week to people, uh, I will uh, ask them to do things like uh, stalls. Yeah, yeah, uh, stalls. And, and whenever I ask people to do stalls, this always amazes me. Um, the number of people that feel anxious about doing a stall in an airplane absolutely amazes me. They love flying. But they fly with a, a great degree of residential fear tucked in the back of their mind because, uh, well, basically they're unable to predict what the airplane's going to do. And stalls for many pilots uh, are one of those things where people feel they can't predict what the airplane's going to do. So let me ask you a question. 
would you stall an airplane at 2,000 feet above ground level? Would you do that? Yeah, most people are saying, yeah, of course I would. Would you stall an airplane at 1,500 feet above ground level? Most people are going, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, I would. What? And would you stall an airplane at 1,000 feet above ground level? Most people are going, eh, I, I don't, I don't, no, that's so low. And then I ask this final question. Would you stall an airplane at 500 feet above ground level? Most people are going, no way, ain't going to happen. Never, 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 no, no way. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't want you to do this, but I'm just making the point uh, as, uh, as an example. And it's a, it's a very important example. I would have absolutely no problem stalling an airplane at 500 feet above ground level. I do it at 400 feet above ground level. Almost any general aviation airplane, but in particular, uh, the airplanes I fly, Cessnas, Pipers, Comanches, uh, uh, Cirrus or Cirri, when you have more than one, um, I, I would have no problem stalling an airplane at, at uh, 500 feet above ground level. And you want to know why? Because I know exactly what the airplane's going to do. I can predict its behavior and being able to predict the behavior means that in essence, I have my own psychic hotline tucked away inside my brain. And uh, you know what the psychic hotline is, right? You call them and they tell you, they see a big phone bill in your future. But uh, I can predict the future because I know that when you stall an airplane, if you know how to use those rudders properly, if the nose starts to yaw one way or the other, in other words, one ring starts to drop versus the other, you can immediately stop that. Uh, you can prevent it, but you can also immediately stop it if indeed it does occur. There's nothing in an airplane that's going to hurt you in terms of stalls, or for that matter, anything else that you don't have control over. That's a very, very important point to keep in mind. So if for some reason you're not maintaining that same level of pleasure you experience when you fly an airplane, uh, that is something to consider, all right? That is a, a very important thing. You need to have skill upgrade training and you get it by flying with a sharp flight instructor. And there are a lot of sharp CFIs out there. And uh, uh, and and by the way, just uh, since, since it's my show and I can talk about anything I want, let me give you give you another idea that just popped into my mind. One of the most frequent uh, emails I get from people over the years is, uh, Rod, I, I'm scared in an airplane. Okay. They're not, yeah, they're not necessarily scared of, of frightened of stalls. They're, they're just, they're frightened. They develop an existential fear of being in an airplane. And I've written several articles on this. They are all on my blog at rodmachado.com. And you just go to the top menu where it says blog and, uh, articles like why we make excuses not to fly pilot demons and and so on and so forth and uh, all available for you to read that talk and address this particular question but the idea of a feeling of uh, fear in an airplane typically because you know you're worried about stalls you're worried about getting flipped inverted by uh, wake turbulence you're, you're worried about mountain wave flipping the airplane over all things that uh, you have complete control over by the way um there's one solution to that problem, and that is not uh, to sit down with me or any other person that can give you counsel uh, in terms of handling that fear. The talking cure doesn't work. Cognitive therapy doesn't work very well in this instance. There is one thing that does work, and that is you go out and you take one hour uh, aerobatic training with a competent aerobatic pilot, one hour. One lesson, one hour, if you can go longer, great. One hour of aerobatic training, and you do two things. You learn how to fly inverted and to right yourself from the inverted position. And you learn how to do spin recovery and uh, spin entry and spin recovery. Those two things will cure 95 to 99% of all the uh, anxiety you may have about flying an airplane. That is a statement of fact. And I've seen it happen over and over and over again. So with that in mind, uh, you know, those, those simple things can keep flying as exciting and fun for you uh, through all stages of your aviation career and uh, maintain a high level of pleasure. And, uh, you know, that's kind of, uh, it, it's, it's the best recommendation I can, I can give you for these kind of things. 
Now, there's, a, there's another thing that is, is really interesting. And I just mentioned the word wake turbulence. And uh, I get so excited talking about this because I, 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 these are the kind of things people need to hear. People who fly airplanes need to hear. And uh, as you could tell, I had coffee this morning. I feel like I could vibrate through solid matter. But uh, actually, even if I didn't, I normally get excited talking about airplanes like this. Wake turbulence. All right. You see, generally in an airplane, there are there are no things you should in aviation. There are almost no things that you should fear. Yeah. Thunderstorms. That goes without saying you stay away from thunderstorms. Twenty five miles laterally. Stay away. FA says 20. I say 25. It just so happens that the Strategic Air Command also said 25 miles. So I think they have a good bead on what is safe regarding thunderstorms. Um, the uh, thing that you should fear, though, and there is one thing that you should fear. No, not flying. Flying is not dangerous. No, I, and I, I disagree with those folks who say it is. Flying is risky, uh, but you can handle the risk. It is not dangerous. Dangerous means a hazard that is going to cause you harm. And uh, no, if flying is not dangerous. What is dangerous, though, is wake turbulence. Uh, wake turbulence presents a great degree of risk to any pilot. And of course, pilots don't normally fall victim to wake turbulence because they can, here's the, uh, here's the key word here, because they can, in fact, this is so important, everybody out there in the uh, audience, I want you to take your finger and do this. No, no, really, I, I, I want you to do that. And anybody who's listening in the room uh, with a person who's actually not putting his finger in the ear, but watch, watching this program, I want you to go ahead and I want you to manually take their hand and stretch their finger out and put it right there. Why do I want you to do that? Because what I'm about to say is so important. I don't want it to go in one ear and out the other. Flight Weight turbulence is the thing you should fear because weight turbulence from a 757 has a vertig vertiginous rotating energy of 300 feet per second. It is destructive to uh, an airplane, considering that your average thunderstorm has a vertical velocity wind shear variable of 50 foot per second to show up as red on uh, an airline pilot's radar screen. So that's dangerous stuff. Wingtip vortices can flip an airplane right over on its back. Uh, it can rip the wings off an airplane, as experienced by a pilot landing at Van Nuys with an overhead approach into Burbank Airport by a 757 many years ago. It actually caused the wing to bend on a Zlin. So um, this is something you want to treat very seriously. And uh, that is that means you have to know how to avoid white turbulence because you can't see it. It's an invisible hazard. And what that means, as simple as this, it, th there's really no big secret to doing this. And that is you, if you're making an approach to an airport and you're following a heavy jet, you're following a, 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 a jet, heavy jet, if you're following anything that weighs close to 12,500 pounds, heck, if you're following anything other than a small general aviation airplane, you um, will land Stay above the glide path or stay on the glide path. If that person's following the glide path, you'll stay in trail three to four miles. ATC will give you those, uh, uh, tell you to how to how to follow an aircraft. In other words, uh, we'll tell you, caution you about wingtip vortices or wake turbulence, and you'll maintain visual separation. You will not get close. You'll maintain the same same separation you were m maintaining when ATC issued the wingtip vortice here, wake turbulence caution, you'll stay on the glide path. My preference is to stay a little above it and you'll land beyond the point that he lands. There's no big secret there. You'll touch down beyond the point, not dipping down into his glide path, land beyond the point. And if he's taking off like a John Wayne airport, uh, runway 20 right, uh, air, large jet aircraft, and in this case, it'd be a 767 or 757, takes off on uh, two zero right, climbing like that. I'll watch the point where the aircraft actually rotates, uh, knowing that the wheels are gonna lift off uh, the ground very close to that point. And I will make sure I rotate way before that. And I will not climb into his glide, glide path. I call the tower and say, tower, I'm gonna make an a, immediate right turn after takeoff. And uh, they, I'll always say, I've never had been denied this. They always say, Roger, and hopefully the tower's not too close to where I'm turning because that can give them kind of a thrill, but then I'll turn immediately away from the, uh, from the climb path. And that's, you know, again, you can avoid it. That's something you need 
to be aware of. Everything else for that matter uh, is not something that should cause you fear, but it should cause you concern if it has a high degree of risk associated with it, in which case then you just um, handle the risk. You just do what's necessary to be competent and capable and fly your airplane safely. Now, a couple of other things I want you to consider too. Um, the, uh, the the idea that um, you know we can fly an airplane safely and and do so, uh, I, I have to tell you there are two things that could cause you a great deal of stress in an airplane, and two things that you know might actually uh, increase your risk in an airplane, and that is this. Two things that, in fact, I'll just rephrase this another way. Two things that can, that can radically increase your risk, but I'm going to rephrase it this way. I can reduce your risk of having an accident. Take whatever uh, potential, let's say a statistical potential you might have, you personally, for having an accident. I can cut that in half by 50%, if not reduce it by 70 to 80% <clears throat> by doing one thing. And that is, say, if you are rushing and you catch yourself rushing, the moment you rush, you increase your potential for having an accident. The moment you catch yourself rushing and you say, I need to stop rushing, which means that, you know, no, even if you're rushing, uh, which means that you're engaging in self-reflective thinking and you say, OK, I, I just need to stop, stop rushing. I'm going too fast. People make mistakes when they rush and they do things that they in their right mind wouldn't ordinarily do. I'm sitting at Ramona Airport many years ago and I'm with my student. We're sitting on the bench. We just landed and my student goes, look at that. Look at that. And I look over and my student goes, oh, that guy's got a tow bar on his airplane. You got to prevent them from taking off. So I, I'm looking at that and it's a Cessna 150 taxiing down the taxiway. Actually, it was a 172 taxiing down the taxiway with an instructor and student in the airplane and the tow bar is on his airplane. I thought, well, I got to stop him. So I raced out onto the taxiway and I flagged him down and uh, the instructor opens his window. And I said, ah, listen, you, you, you can't take off. You've got a tow bar on your airplane. He says, tow bar. He says, we just landed. So apparently they took off from another airport flew all the way over to Ramona, landed with a tow bar on their airplane. Well, it sure makes it easy, you know, that way you don't have to rehook up the tow bar again when you pull the airplane out of the transient area, but that's a dangerous thing to do because once the prop strikes that, well, damage the prop, throw the tow bar into the wing, uh, very bad juju. So rushing is very dangerous. And you have to, I, again, I can cut your accident rate potential. In other words, whatever potential you may have for having an accident or an incident, cut it in half by simply asking you to catch yourself rushing and then uh, ceasing that behavior. But it does require self-reflective thinking. So you have to do a lot of self-monitoring. And you self-monitor by asking yourself questions, which, by the way, is what smart pilots do. Second thing is that if you're flying with other people, in an airplane. I can't prove this, but I think your greatest potential for having a weather-related accident is when you're flying with another person on the airplane. Statistically, it's almost impossible to prove. But the reason for that is that uh, when we have another person on an airplane, we don't typically think in our right mind. And let me tell you why. Many years ago, Dr. Jerry Harvey did research on this, and uh, he, he came up with a... Um, uh, a theory that it's not our agreements with other people that we have trouble managing. I'm sorry. It's not our disagreements with other people that we have trouble managing. What we have trouble managing as pilots and or uh, non-pilots, we have trouble managing our agreements. You see, when I disagree with you, I know exactly where you stand. Uh, there, there's, It's very clear. So, okay, I disagree with you. I know where you stand. And so be it. We go on from there. If I make an agreement with you, then that agreement uh, is an, something that I did, perhaps because I wanted to remain friends with you. I didn't want to become excommunicated from my social group. I, I didn't want to experience that and or I didn't know how to handle your disappointment. See, we're terrible at managing agreements. 
But when you disagree, I know exactly where you stand. And if you don't believe that, then ask, you know, think, has, do you know people who have gotten married, they agreed to get married and they really didn't want to, but they have a hard, they had a hard time uh, breaking off the engagement, breaking off the marriage, simply because once you make an agreement like that, you, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do to uh, engage in disappointing someone else. But sometimes that's what you have to do. That's why in Southern California, three out of four marriages end uh, in divorce and, and the other one ends in murder. So uh, <laughs> it's really bad news. Uh, we don't do too well out here in Southern California. So the point there is this. When you're flying with someone else in an airplane, uh, you must realize that you are in a position where uh, it's easy to mismanage an agreement. And let me just and this will be the last story I tell here and then we'll take a few questions. Um, do what my friend Pete does before anybody gets in an airplane with him. Pete says this. He asks them this question. Three people going with him in a Cessna 172. Pete says, okay, before we go, I just want to know this. Uh, if there's, is there anyone here, any of you folks uh, here that would be unable to handle the disappointment or the change in plans so that if we didn't make the original airport, if we had to turn back, if we had to cancel a flight midway, uh, if for some reason that I, as the pilot in command said, you know, we, we really need to land at an alternate airport. Is there anybody that couldn't handle that disappointment? Is there anybody that couldn't handle it uh, from a, um, let, let's say from a schedule point of view or whatever, social point of view or whatever? And all of them will probably say yes. If one person says, no, I've got to be at this airport on time, then you say, okay, fine. I'm sorry. I can't take you. Yep. That's what you have to say. What Pete did was so classy because what he's done is this. He said basically that uh, he basically got other people to participate in the decision. And by doing that, they have a stake in the game. They have skin in the game. And if Pete has to cancel the flight, has to turn back, uh, has to return to the airport, he knows those people are going to be disappointed. But, and here's the key, and hopefully some of you still haven't taken your finger out of your ear, so this will work out pretty well. <clears throat> he knows that the disappointment won't affect him because he got them to participate in the uh, decision that's a classy way to handle that problem so again got a monitor for self for rushing and you have to put a stop to that requires self-reflective thinking you put another person on the airplane one or more you are more susceptible to mismanaging an agreement and consequently uh you are more more vulnerable uh, to make a decision that pleases people uh, in the short term but it ends up uh, ultimately putting you and your passengers at greater risk so that's all I have to say, folks. And if you have any questions, Mike uh, is going to uh, take those questions. And Mike, are, are you there, sir? Captain Mike? I am, Rod. Uh, th thank you very much. You got a, a lot of really good food for thought there. And we had a couple great questions out of the audience here. So let me toss a couple of those to you and then we'll <laughs> get over to the prizes. So uh, first, a couple of quick ones here. Uh, VJ Chinasami asks, I'm a student pilot, just got solo endorsement. Can I do acrobatic training? Of course. Of course you can. But that's personal. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you're not going to go out and do acrobatic training on your own. But can you do it with an instructor? Obviously, that's what you're asking. And uh, if you <clears throat> feel comfortable doing that, um, yes, there's nothing wrong with that. I would just have your instructor start you out with doing something simple like... Um, Perhaps a loop, rolling the airplane inverted, an aileron roll. Uh, I would avoid the lumshavox, which is the Czechoslovakian word for headache. Uh, I would avoid doing those maybe until the second lesson. I've never done a lumshavox. I would never do one. Uh, I'm, I'm just not that brave. So uh, I'm too old to do a lumshavox. So there. Yeah, I, said it. I would second that and I would even extend it a little <laughs> bit saying anytime, whether you've got a license or you're a student pilot still, anytime you have an opportunity to take on some sort of additional training, almost any sort of additional training, that's a good thing. It'll probably, it, stands, it has a high likelihood of, of helping you become a better pilot. Yeah, exactly. Just be careful on the introduction. You don't want to scare yourself and, and you, you won't. Right. Just, this is going to be very novel to you. You shouldn't have seen a loop uh, at your point uh, in, in training. 
in the traffic pattern. So sure. And, and by all instructor. means, when you get with an aerobatic instructor to, to take this on, let them know where you are in your training. The instructor exactly. should ask you that when, when you get started. For I that. hope so. I hope so. So a little while ago, you talked about uh, the incredible amount of stimulation that's available through the biggest instrument we have on the airplane, which is the windshield looking outside. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Mark Shepard asks, what kind of stimulation do we get when we're in solid IMC? Well, it's a different question, and you don't. It, it, <laughs> the purpose of flying in solid IMC is not to stimulate yourself. The purpose of flying in IMC is to get someplace when the weather's bad. And uh, but to show you how much you'll miss that stimulation and and and, and again, that's I, I mean, that's an accurate answer. Right. Uh, clearly, you don't have the same change in panorama and what have you. All clouds look pretty much the same from the inside. Uh, at least that's been my experience. But here's an interesting thing. You fly for 40 hours under the hood or under the foggles or the hood and the foggles if you want some really strong instrument weather. Um, and all of a sudden, one day you return back to VFR flying. And it feels abnormal to you. And, uh, you know, at 40 hours under the hood and all of a sudden you're flying VFR, every student I had that uh, uh, was able to pay attention to the experience said, man, that was really weird. I had a hard time getting used to that. And yes, because uh, the sensory rich stimulation from looking outside that window <clears throat> is all of a sudden uh, an assault in a good way on the senses and uh uh, it's a uh, it's a consistent phenomena, and I love hearing about it when students experience it. Yeah, there's nothing like that feeling of, of flying. I, I especially like flying right above a cloud deck, just a few feet above a cloud deck. You get the sensation of the speed as well as you know the stuff off in the distance. And oh yeah. Every now and again, maybe you fly through a little puff of cloud or something, and that's really yeah. cool. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. It may every once in a while, it may accidentally. You go through a little puff of cloud. I mean, accidentally, like there's one off to your right. And no, you don't want to do that, though. But have you ever had a student try to flare above a solid cloud deck as they're coming down on an instrument approach? No, I haven't. I watched. I, I see, I always take my student pilots up, even when the weather's poor, to give them some experience going up and down through clouds. Not that I want them to do that on their own, but experience is coins, commodity, it has value. So, so when we make an instrument approach, I always approach back into the airport. Um, they'll, you know, at, at Orange County, let's say you have a 2,000 foot MSL cloud deck, you're going to descend through 1,000 feet of clouds. And as they're coming down, a solid cloud deck now, you know, you got a temperature inversion above that solid cloud deck. As they come down, you can start to see them go, whoa, whoa. No, I, don't do that. Don't do that. Whoa. <laughs> it just keep it tickles down. me to know it. Yeah. We and, humans and sometimes are so predictable. I might also say there that that window stimulation, the the gorgeous view outside the airplane, the reason that we fly an airplane to enjoy that view, that's a positive stimulation. But I oh. think when you're in a cloud, your body can give you some negative stimulations, and these are in the form of various optical and kinesthetic <clears throat> illusions that you get. Somatographic illusion comes to mind, and I forget the name of the one where you're turning and you uh, your vestibular system tells you you're not turning anymore. Yes, Coriolis illusion, or otherwise known as the turning, the not turning illusion. Yeah, no, you're right. Right. That's so these amazing. are the negative stimulations. And when it, part of learning how to fly IFR is to learn to disregard those negative stimulations. So, yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and now yeah. this one might be a little bit more food for thought here. Very early on, you were talking about, um, a, 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 you know, you've been flying a long time, a little bit longer than I have. Um, but uh, a guy, I can't, I'm sh sure I'm going to mispronounce the name here, Anonymous Attendee, oh, yeah. I know maybe, a, maybe a French attendee, um, asks, so as one ages with a natural degradation of skills and abilities, how can we systematically train to maintain or improve one's piloting skills? Yeah, well, uh, the answer is simple. Practice, practice piloting skills. Of course, if you could fly every day, that'd be great. Uh, that's not possible though. Flying is expensive. I mean, think about it. Go out to an airport to run a Cirrus, 250 bucks, 270 bucks, maybe, uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, more expensive than renting a multi-engine airplane, uh, to rent an instructor with it. You're talking about a $400 flight with one instructor. I'm, uh, how could anybody afford that? It just, it just boggles my mind. You know, if you can buy an airplane, buy the least expensive, uh, 
smallest, slowest airplane you can get. I bought my Cessna 150 for $20,000. And <clears throat> I put a $30,000 engine in it later on, but <laughs> it's totally worth it. Uh, and uh, that was the upgrade. And uh, I I love the airplane. If I, my air, an air coupe is one of my favorite airplanes. You can pick them up. Well, all used airplanes are more expensive now. But you know what, folks? Get four people together. Start a flying club and divvy it up. They're, just don't argue with it. Get four people, build a flying club, and AOPA has some AOPA has some good literature on this, and get it done. Get an airplane and then share it between four people. But the second thing is get yourself a good flight simulator. Um, uh, X-Plane, X-Plane 12, X-Plane 11. My favorite simulator of all times is Microsoft Simulator X. Now, they have newer versions of Microsoft, real sexy, but uh, X you can get for about 40 bucks. And if you have a joystick, which right, I have a joystick right here, right here, and uh, I use it all the time. I hold it just because it's, uh, yeah, e exactly. Well, we'll have a fly off here. Uh, it just, this feels so natural. Get yourself a joystick. If you can get rudder pedals, that's fantastic. And uh, uh, practice, practice. Uh, flying the airplane uh it, and you know what it's interesting people say well you know a simulator doesn't fly like a real airplane well folks i've flown real airplanes that don't fly like real airplanes so you know that's 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 just what you're trying to do is build uh motor perceptual and cognitive behaviors in the simulator that transfer to an airplane now the thing is about flying coordinated you can't feel there's there's no feeling sensation when you fly a simulator but that's okay because the highest level of flying coordination is not necessarily flying by uh seat of your pants <clears throat> it is in an airplane when you roll into a turn to the right or to the left you just use enough rudder so the airplane doesn't yaw in the opposite direction it yaws in the direction of turn roll out you roll out so that the nose doesn't change direction as you're rolling out. That's the whole point of rudders in an airplane, to point the nose in the direction you're turning uh, and to keep it from pointing where you don't want to turn. You can do that in a simulator. The skill you can build up in a simulator is mind-boggling uh, if you just practice. And I wish I had an hour to talk about it. Uh, but I'm a big believer in simulators, too. I know I you are. did I a simulator training session at work last week, and it was very enlightening, even though I've been flying those for a long time. And uh, right. one, one thing I'll add to that, a number of years ago, uh, my friend Kim First made a documentary called Flying to Feathered Edge. It was a, a biopic about uh, Bob Hoover. Oh. And the final section of that film was about his very conscious decision to stop flying as PIC he kind of explores this whole realm of aging and the degradation, not yeah. just of <clears throat> motor skill, but um, the decision making process, the reaction that the, the uh, foresight ability. Um, you know, I, I, I've been flying a long time. It doesn't mean I'm a good pilot. It just means I've done it for a long time. Yes, but yes, it, yes. At some point, and I thought it was a, a really good exploration of that idea. So I would recommend that if you, if, if you can go uh, find it, Flying <clears> the <throat> Feathered Edge. Great film. It's a good point. And by the way, I will say, uh, I know you're a good pilot, even have, although I haven't flown with you, because one, you take a check ride every six months. But I've also talked to a lot of people that have flown with you, and they say you're, you're just one hell of an instructor and an excellent pilot. And to comment on uh, the simulators you flew, uh, United Airlines had a report one time of somebody having a heart attack in one of your simulators, <clears throat> a, a pilot on training. He had a heart attack. You know, they were throwing the they, they killed three engines and he only had two on the airplane <laughs> and uh, really put the pressure on. And the guy had a heart attack and they're dragging this guy out of the simulator and they wave the other guy over. OK, next, bring him on in. Yeah, and uh, right. it's kind of like uh, the simulator is another name for heart attack simulator. Uh, in the, but it wasn't. Right. A sim I mean, that's how real your simulator is. So. Yeah, they they are but, very real uh, for sure. And And one more thing, Simcom that had simulators that did training, didn't have motion-based simulators. But the FAA said, hey, we'll give you the same, and well, they said this 15 years ago, I don't know if it's still valid, but they said, we'll give you the same training um, benefit in the simulator as motion-based simulators because it doesn't matter. Now, of course, we're, there's a definition between simulators, AT, uh, ADs and BTADs, but that's neither here nor there. My point stands for what it's what I stated there. Yeah, you can do it. There's a tremendous amount of learning that can happen in a simulator. Yeah. And so.